by July 1974, most of the work in the Netherlands had been completed, and it was time to ship the UNS to the Western Test Range in the USA to be launched. The long journey begins at the European Space Laboratory in Nordwijk, where the satellite is mounted in a shock-free casing and packed into a steel container. A special air-sprung truck then takes it to Schiphol Airport together with spare parts and the complete testing equipment which had been specially built for the purpose. The first truck carries the UNS, a load of 135 kilograms. The four trucks that follow carry the auxiliary equipment. Total weight, 30,000 kilograms. This freight aircraft will carry the whole load to the west coast of America. In order to be able to retrieve and set up the necessary testing equipment directly on arrival in the USA, a comprehensive administrative system was used. By stacking the crates in a certain way on the pallets, it was possible to fly all the equipment over in one load. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. We would like to have the weather forecast of the Atlantic. Well, uh, you see here on the European side a big high pressure area, and uh, there is a possibility for the developing of some isolated CBs. It stops up to about 35. The ANS goes on board last. There's little cloud and a following wind. Perfect weather conditions for the UN's first flight, though not, of course, its first real flight. The ANS lands against the sunset at the Vandenberg Air Force Base, close to the Western Test Range. It's night before everything has been unloaded.
at the launching pad, the last preparations are made. The progress of the most recent tests is discussed daily with NASA officials. And I've heard from the people that were yesterday here. At NASA, the UNS project had the status of a cooperative program. The Americans supplied the scout rocket and were responsible for the launch. The first three stages of the rocket are transported to the launching platform. The fourth stage, carrying the UNS, is attached at a later stage. In view of the weight of the UNS, the 25-meter-long rocket has been equipped with a new type of first stage, increasing its power. Before the fourth stage, carrying the UNS, can be coupled to the rest of the scout rocket, a balancing test must first be carried out. After the launch, the fourth stage of the scout spins at more than 150 revolutions per minute about its axis. This is done because this stage has no guiding system of its own and can only be kept stable in this way. The UNS must therefore also be able to withstand this rotation. The test is carried out in a specially protected area. It's from about this speed that the yo-yo will later slow down the satellite. Only after the UNS has stood up to this test is final permission given for the launch. The fourth stage, with the satellite fixed inside it, is placed in a small container and transported to the launching platform. For reasons of safety, the western test range is on the coast, so that in the event of a launch failing, the rocket falls harmlessly into the sea. The assembled first three stages of the scout rocket lie ready in a transportable hangar. The fourth stage and the satellite must now be coupled. After coupling to the scout rocket, the nose cone is mounted. The UNS itself is protected from dust up to the last second by a plastic cover. 130 seconds after the launch, when two stages have burnt out, the shields will be jettisoned. Then the third stage ignites. The scout rocket is launched at the same place as it was coupled together. When the hangar has been moved back, it can be erected to its vertical position.
the last procedures before the launch now take place. A worldwide network of communication stations is alerted to assist the UNS in its flight into orbit around the Earth. The center of the flight operations lies on the other side of the world. The project directors have arranged for the European Space Operations Center in Darmstadt to control the rocket. Soon after the rocket has left the ground, an international group of communications technicians led by Dutch experts take over control of the flight. It's the first time that this center has been used to control such an advanced satellite system. The ground station is not in Darmstadt, but in the Ardennes in Belgium, near the village of Raidu, which also belongs to the European Space Organization. Data is exchanged twice daily with the UNS via these large antennas. This data primarily consists of the astronomical measurements made during the previous 12 hours and other data concerning the operation of the satellite's equipment. Simultaneously with the reception of this data, commands for a new series of astronomical observations are transmitted to the UNS. These programs are compiled daily by the astronomers in cooperation with the Flight Control Center at Darmstadt. circuits make sure everything's working remember we've got uh, 12 hours of hard work ahead of us we have a green light from the rain high speed recorders on team receiving is go all systems report launch go second stage propulsion go second stage go spacecraft are you go spacecraft go roger mechanical systems go Fuel system go. RCO reports clear to launch. Umbilical disconnect enabled. Command to struct circuit is open. Matex pressurized. Ready to launch. Roger. Alaska Darmstadt, we have PCM lock on your data. Roger. Uh, Roger, you're now configured for data with uh, Santiago. And, uh, At the Western the test range, the moment of launching now approaches. Roger. Santiago, Darmstadt Network. Santiago? Roger, you in possession of the, the BBM Daytime Group 29er, slant bar 1119er Zulu. High speed recorders on. TM receiving is go. All systems report. Watch go. In Holland, there was widespread interest in the actual launching of this first Netherlands astronomical satellite. This is how Dutch listeners heard the launch described. We net genoemd de tijdklok gecontroleerde procedure begonnen waardoor de raket hier is loodrecht. De lucht hier ging nu langzaam maar zeker in een precies gecontroleerde baan komt.
Alex opneemt steeds toe. Hij heeft minuten zijn tien, kom maar één graad boven het horizontaal. En op dat punt bevindt zich nu ook het uitbranden van de eerste trap. En de raket bevindt zich nu ongeveer 41 kilometer in zuidelijke richting. De eerste trap is gestoten. Het was hier zichtbaar. De richting van de Zuidpool, het gewicht is nu van 21.600 kilogram naar 8.750 kilogram teruggelopen. De snelheid is 1370 meter per seconde. Steeds zichtbaar op de monitor. Wacht een mooi plaatje, geweldig mooi. Succesvolle lancering. Nederland uh, gaat nu ook deelnemen aan de ruimtevaart. Nederland de de neemt nu deel aan de ruimtevaart, kun je zeggen. We zijn uh, op dit ogenblik al 3 minuten en 24 seconden lang het elfde ruimtevaartland ter wereld. Misschien dat Peter Schreuder nog luistert en nog even terug kunnen gaan naar Californië. Peter? Hugo, hier gaat alles prima. De volgorde van de, de gebeurtenissen in de ruimte, die volgen elkaar met een uh, zekerheid die uh, wel rustig is na dat moment van spanning dat we hier hebben gehad. This marks the beginning of an important time for the flight control center in Darmstadt. The ANS carried out its work from September 1974 until April 1976. However, the ANS did not go into the correct circular orbit at an altitude of 500 kilometers above the Earth. A fault in the scout rocket made the orbit elliptical, its distance from the Earth varying from 260 kilometers to 1,160 kilometers. Because of this deviation, it took longer to complete the program than had originally been intended. The satellite was designed to take measurements for a period of six months. This was extended when the ANS appeared to be in such an excellent technical state as to be able to make further useful measurements. The ultraviolet experiments examine the luminosity of young hot stars which are formed in this kind of cloud. Similar experiments had been conducted before in space but with less sensitive instruments. The existence of extremely hot stars in the Milky Way has now been confirmed. Temperatures of 100,000 degrees Celsius were measured in comparison to our own sun, which is a mere 6,000 degrees Celsius. These are stars that are at the end of their lives and have become very small. Special attention was paid to this nebula, the Eta Carinae Nebula, as photographed by Kitt Peak National Observatory in America. The same nebula, this time its center. It contains a star with a temperature of 25,000 degrees Celsius. The ANS found that the large nebula surrounding the star had a most interesting composition. The X-ray experiments mainly observe dying stars. A star can collapse and become a black hole. At the same time, it can also emit a cloud of gas which is visible as a ring around it. The ANS discovered three new types of sources of X-rays. One source consists of flare stars, which are stars which suddenly become brighter for a short period. Sirius, the brightest star in the firmament, was also found to emit X-rays. The radiation comes from the corona, which is like that of our own sun, and consists of a thin cloud of gas surrounding the star. The most remarkable discovery made by the ANS was of unusually strong discharges of energy from globular clusters, which consists of between 100,000 and a million old stars, in the middle of which there may be a black hole. Cygnus X1, a black hole, was also found to be giving off X-rays. The ANS has made fundamental discoveries that have been of inestimable benefit to astronomy. The reputation for science of the Netherlands has risen accordingly. Industry has gained experience in designing and building complex and extremely reliable systems. Furthermore, the project provided government, industry and the academic world with an excellent opportunity to carry out a difficult task in close cooperation. Roger, thank you, MC.
that out and see how 